Welcome to Money Matters with Karen Ford, where you will learn methods and manners for increase to help you move from financial bondage to financial freedom. Hello, I'm Karen Ford and welcome to Money Matters. Today I want to talk to you about biblical prosperity. Is there such a thing? Does God really want us to be prosperous? And if He does want us to be prosperous, why does He want us to be prosperous? You know, back in the day when I first got saved, this was, gosh, 28 years ago, 28, 27 or 28 years ago I got saved. and I. I saw something very interesting. I noticed people being prosperous and living in nice homes and driving fancy cars and wearing really high-end clothing. And I thought, wow, Lord, uh, they're really blessed. How come I'm, I'm not blessed? Do you pick a select few of people that you want to dump on? I mean, can I have that? And I, I grew up, you know, I have four brothers and two sisters. And when you're, when you grow up in a large family like that with mom and dad, there were nine of us in this house with one bathroom. I'm not quite sure how we did that, but you know, when you're a child and you have that many siblings, you don't generally have all the bells and the whistles and the toys and things like that that other children in the neighborhood do. I mean, today, kids have their own iPhone, they have their own iPad, they have their own TV or computer, they have all of these kinds of things. Well, if I was growing up today, I can tell you, I would not have grown up with any of those things. We didn't do without, we weren't necessarily poor, but we just, you know, we just had what we needed and maybe a few desires and wants that, you know, mom and dad could bless us with. So I grew up with a, a mentality that maybe, you know, God only picks a few people to, to bless. Maybe God only picks a few people that he can prosper. But let me tell you, brothers and sisters, that is not the case at all. As I dug and dig into God's word, I slowly discovered wonderfully discovered that God does want us to be prosperous and there's reasons why he wants us to be prosperous. So let's delve into God's word today. In Ecclesiastes, in, in Ecclesiastes, it says, money answers all things. Say that with me. Money answers all things. It really does. Did you know that in the word of God, there are over 2,500 scriptures pertaining to money? 2,500. And Jesus talked about money more than he talked about heaven and hell. Look at it. Two thirds of the parables that Jesus teaches us all have to do with money and giving and prosperity. So it must be pretty important to God to talk about it that much in his word. Now, in 3 John 2, it says, Beloved, I wish above all things that you may prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. Now, we can substitute that word even with the word like. Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health like your soul prospers. Well, what is your soul? Our soul is our mind our will, and our emotions. See, it's not enough that God wants us to be healthy spiritually. He wants us to be healthy physically. He never intended any of us to have any sickness or disease, no COVID. He doesn't want us to be sick. Why did Jesus go to the cross? He died on the cross and shed his blood and took those lashes and took those beatings so that you and I could walk in health. He wants us to be healthy physically. He wants us to be healthy financially. He wants us to be healthy in our soul, in our mind, and in our will, and our emotions. He doesn't want us to be depressed one day and then okay the next day. He doesn't want us to be depressed. He doesn't want us to be sad. No, when Jesus died on the cross, he took sickness, sorrow, and sin. He died on that cross so that you and I would not have to be sin sinners. He died on that cross so you and I would not have to walk in any sickness. And he died on that cross so that you and I would not have to walk in any sorrow. Well, Karen, it seems like sometimes I sin, sometimes I'm sick, and sometimes I'm sorrowful, but you don't have to be. 
You don't have to be. Those are the three S's right there that Jesus died in the, died on the cross for us. He died so that you and I would not have to walk in any sickness, so that you and I would not have to walk in any sin, and so that you and I would not have to walk in any kind of sorrow. Now that was a little bunny trail in this teaching today. So that is for someone here today listening and watching this. Jesus died on that cross because you and I, he wants us to be healthy physically. He wants us to be healthy financially. He wants us to be healthy in our soul realm, which is our mind, our will, and our emotions in Jesus' name. What else do we discover in God's word? In Deuteronomy 8.18, it says, And you shall remember the Lord your God, for it is he who gives you the power to get wealth. Did you know that God will give you power to get wealth? Now, that does not mean that we can sit home on our recliner and just say, okay, God, bring it on. Bring me the wealth. No, it says that he will give you the power to get, the power to get wealth. We have to go and get it. Well, how do we go and get it? Well, we work, right? It, the scripture says, if you don't work, neither should you eat. Work is good. God gave man a job to do when he created Adam and Eve. He told them to tend the garden. So work is good. We're to go and get the wealth. Also, another way that we can get wealth is by giving our offerings, sowing seed into the kingdom of God right? Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. If you sow love, you're going to get love. If you sow money, you're going to get money. Whatsoever a man sows, that shall he also reap. We're to go and get it. We get it by working. We give it by sowing. We give it by giving offerings. There's a wide array of ways for us to go and get wealth. But why does he give us the power to get wealth? That he may establish his covenant in the earth. Hallelujah which he swore to your fathers as it is at its day. What is his covenant? His covenant is that he sent his only begotten son, Jesus Christ, to die on that cross for you and for me. He wants, he doesn't want anybody to perish. God gave his son, his only begotten son, that we would receive him and live an eternal life. That is why God wants us to be prosperous. That is one of the reasons why he gives us the power to get wealth, that he may establish his covenant in the earth today. Hallelujah to God. But we're to remember the Lord our God. That word remember in the Hebrew means to be mindful, to boast, to make mention, to take thought and to confess. Oh God, you are the God of the heaven and the earth. Oh, God, I bless you this day. I remember you. You're the one who sent your only begotten son. I bless you today, Lord God. I thank you for my house. I thank you for my cars. I thank you I have food on the table. Oh, God, you're the one who provides. That's how we remember God. We bless him. We praise him. We glorify him. And when we do that, the oh, his his presence fills this room. His presence fills wherever you are right now as you bless and you praise him. We remember him. We thank him for all that he's done. Hallelujah. God wants us to remember him, to be mindful of him, to boast in him, to make mention of him and what he's done. You know, we're getting ready to, you know, sometimes we buy presents at Christmas time and sometimes we buy presents for people that we love just because, right? Just because. And when you give a gift to someone, don't you enjoy them opening up that present, whether it's their birthday, whether it's Christmas, whether it's just a because present? Don't you enjoy watching their expression when they open it? Maybe it's something that they've always wanted, but they never would buy for themselves. Isn't that such an expression of joy to watch them open it 
They're so happy. And don't you get joy out of that? Watching them open it because you took the time to buy the gift or maybe you took the time to go on Amazon and order the gift for them and ship it to them. But don't you enjoy watching their expression? What does God do when he gives gifts to us. Oh, he gets so joyful that, you know, it says here in that scripture, it says he gives us the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant. And that word power means force, might, strength, ability. God not only wants you to prosper, but he gives us the force, the might, the ability, the strength. God wants us to prosper and he gets joy in it. He gets joy in it. He gets joy in the fact that he is blessing us and giving us that power to get wealth. That word wealth means forces, riches, strength, means, and other resources. God has not only given us the ability to create wealth, but he also wants us to have it. Now, when he spoke that, he was speaking that to the children of God. If you are born again today, you are a child of the most high God and you say, you you know what, God, you have given me the power to get wealth. Say that right now. God, you have given me the power to get wealth that you will establish your covenant in the earth. Hallelujah. God, I receive that power to get wealth. And I thank you that as I work, I'm diligent. Maybe God's going to give you witty ideas. Maybe you're going to open a business. God has given you the power to get wealth. Maybe he's going to show you how to invest, where to invest. Start seeking the Lord. God, I thank you for this ability. Help me to use that ability to the highest way I can use it, Lord. You know, there's nothing sadder than somebody having an ability to do something and they don't do it. Somebody having the ability to play the piano or the keyboard, but they hide that gift and never use it. Somebody having the ability to open up a business, but they're too afraid to open up that business. No, if God has given that power and that ability to get wealth in you, he expects you to use it. Glory to God. He has given you that ability to create wealth. He wants us to have, have it. And we have to say, yes, Lord, I received that ability. And now I'm going to use that ability that you gave me. In Psalm 35, 27, it says, Let them shout for joy and be glad who favor my righteous cause and let them say continually, Let the Lord be magnified who has pleasure in the prosperity of his servant. If you're a child of God today, you are his servant and God takes pleasure in your prosperity. This is verse is telling us that God wants us to be prosperous. God is well pleased when we are prosperous. And that word pleasure means delight. He's pleased with when we prosper. He wants us to prosper because it brings him joy. Those of you who are parents, when your kids do something, when your kids get something, when your kids do something they, they worked hard to and they attained something, doesn't that bring you joy? Oh, you're just so delighted. God is delighted and happy and pleasured when you prosper. Hallelujah. When we read these scriptures, I've read quite a few of them right there. We see that money can either be a blessing or it can be a curse. This is because if you focus on money as your main objective and place it ahead of God, that can be disastrous. Well, Karen, you just said that God wants me to be blessed and prosperous. Karen, you just said that God has given me the power to get wealth. Yes, I have. Why have I said that? Because that's what the word of God says. But he doesn't want us to change our focus. He doesn't want us to have die vision, meaning two visions. He doesn't want us to say, okay, well, I kind of, I'm seeking you over here, Lord, but I'm seeking after the money. No, he says in his word, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things shall be added unto you. We definitely, God wants us to be prosperous. He wants us to be blessed. And yes, he's given us the power to get wealth, but he doesn't want us to focus on that and leave him out of it. We must seek God first. 
We seek God first. We put him first of the day. When we get up of a morning, we get our cup of coffee, uh, we use the potty and we seek God first and start seeking his word, seeking his face, praying, praising, seeking him, seeking him. He doesn't want us to seek his hand. He wants us to seek his face. You don't want your children to seek your hand and always want, 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 but not ever want to seek you and spend time with you just because you're their parent. No, you want them to, you want them to spend time with you because they love you, not because they're trying to get something from you. How greater is God? He doesn't want us to seek him to get something from him. Our primary reason should be we're seeking God because we love him and because of who he is. Praise the Lord. God wants you to prosper. God wants you to have money. And let's look at a few reasons why God wants you to have money. All right. Psalm, Psalm 84, 11 in the Amplified says, For the Lord God is a sun and shield. The Lord bestows present grace and favor and future glory, honor, splendor, and heavenly bliss. No good thing will he withhold from him who walks uprightly. In, in God's word translation, it says he does not hold back any blessing. In Psalm 115, 14 in the Amplified, it says, May the Lord God give you increase more and more, you and your children. The first step to biblical financial freedom is tithing. Oh, wait a minute, Karen. You're talking about biblical prosperity. Ah, how is a tithe part of that picture? Well, a tithe, let's define, first of all, what a tithe is. A tithe is 10%, 10% of your income. That's what the word tithe means. And the tithe is a specific amount, which is 10%, for a particular purpose and to a particular place. So let's look at that. There's a set amount. There's a specific place. What is the tithe? The tithe is 10%. Now, I've heard some folks say, well, I get paid, I pay my bills, I go to the grocery store, and then I put gas in my car to get back to work next week, and by the time I get ready to pay my tithe, I don't have enough. Well, that's because that's backwards. See, God wants us to put Him first in everything. So when we get paid, we should tithe first and then pay our bills and go to the grocery store and put gas in the car. Well, Karen, that's not going to work because I don't make enough money. Listen, I can tell you I've been doing this for 28 years and I was in the same boat as you if you have that same mindset. And when God showed me to, that I needed to start tithing, I argued with the Lord. I said, Lord, I don't have enough money to tithe. I can't afford to tithe. And the Lord said, Karen, you can't afford not to tithe because that's what's going to open the windows of heaven over you in Malachi. And he showed me that scripture in Malachi 3. See, God views us when we don't tithe that we're robbing him. See, in Malachi, it says that, you know, the children are saying, hey, what's going on here? And God says, you have tithed, you have robbed me. And the Children of God said, well, how have you robbed me? And God said, in tithes and offerings. And so we're robbing God when we don't tithe. And actually, we're robbing ourselves because when we don't tithe, it's a cycle. We never have enough. We never have enough. And you're never going to have enough unless you tithe. That's just the way it is. So I argued with the Lord and I said, Lord, I don't have enough to tithe. And he said, Karen, I, I'm telling you right now, if you'll start tithing, you're going to see the windows of heaven open over you. I'm going to pour out blessings upon you that you can't even contain. I'll prove it to you. So I began to tithe. And I can't tell you exactly how it happened. I would get checks in the mail or somebody would hand me money or I'd go to the grocery store and I'd get such deals and I, I budgeted so much more for the grocery store and I had more than enough. 
I can't tell you how it's going to happen. I just know it does happen. So if you'll tithe first the 10% and then pay your bills and put gas in your car and go to the grocery store, you're going to see that you're going to have more than enough to do it. See, the tithe should leave your hand first. The tithe belongs to God. And when we don't tithe, we're robbing him. So the tithe is a set amount. It's 10%. Where is this tithe supposed to go? Well, it says in Malachi, bring your tithe into the storehouse that there may be meat in my house. What's the storehouse? The storehouse is the local church. See, God doesn't want us to tithe to Aunt Mary who's living hand to mouth. He doesn't want us to tithe to the TV evangelist. He doesn't want us to tithe to the neighbor down the street. No, he wants us to tithe to the storehouse, which is the local church, because the local church is where we get prayed for, where we get fed, the Word of God, where we get cared for. See, churches should actually have pastors that don't have to live uh, or work secularly. I'm just telling you straight up. See, in the Old Testament, in Numbers, the Levites and the priests would receive the tithe and of course they'd offer it to the Lord. But their job was to offer sacrifice, to devote themselves to the scrolls, to the word at that time, to pray, to help care for the people. And that's what pastors do today. See, that's how God set that up. We should be tithing to the local church. And nowhere in scripture are you gonna see the word give your tithe. No, it says bring your tithe. Why does it say bring your tithe to the storehouse? Because the tithe is not something that we give. See, you can't give something that doesn't belong to you, right? If, I, if you handed me the keys to your car and you said, okay, you can go drive my car for a couple weeks, okay? And then after a couple weeks, I have the keys to your car in my hand and I say, I've been praying about this and I feel led to give you this car. Well, you're going to look at me as if I'm nutty. You're going to say, that's not your car. That's my car. You're returning that car to me. And that's the same way it is with the tithe. See, the tithe is not ours to give to the Lord. The tithe is what we return to the Lord because the scripture says, God says the tithe is mine. It's holy unto the Lord. The tithe is God's. It's 10%. We're to bring it to the local church, which is the storehouse. And we're not giving the tithe. We're returning the tithe because you can't give what doesn't belong to you. And it's for a specific purpose. We talked about this, the Levites and the priests. They were designated. They were chosen. They were the ones to pray, to fast, to to tend to the needs of the people, to devote themselves to the scrolls, to the word. Now, some people say, well, Karen, the tithe was in the Old Testament. We are under the new covenant. Jesus came, he died. We don't have to tithe today, but actually we do. In the Old Testament, God set it up with the Levites and the priests. Abraham tithed to Melchizedek, who was a type of Christ. And then we also see 2,500 years before the law in Genesis. God set it up when Adam and Eve were in the garden. He told them, this tree you are not to eat of, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. That tree in the garden was a tithe. Yes, it was. That was a tree that God did not want them ever to touch, and yet they did. And then in the New Testament, Jesus even talks about the tithe. It says in Matthew 23, 23, he's talking to the religious people of the day, the Sadducees and the Pharisees. And he's saying, look, you've tithed on mint, anise, and cumin, but you've neglected weightier matters of the law, which is justice, mercy. And, and, and God is saying, you should not have done, you should have devoted yourself to this, but not leave the other undone. What's he saying? You really should deem more important the justice and the mercy. But don't leave the other undone. Yeah, I still want you to tithe. Jesus is saying he still wants us to tithe.
Jesus is saying he still wants us to tithe. So the tithe is 10% of our income. It belongs to the local church because in Malachi it says, bring it to the storehouse that there may be meat in thy house. What's the meat? The meat is the word of God. And the specific purpose is so the pastors are actually able to live and do what they're supposed to do without, without having to work secularly. That's the whole reason that God set up the tithe. So biblical prosperity, we know God wants us to be prosperous because he told us that he has given us the power to get wealth that he may establish his covenant in the earth. He wants us to be prosperous. He doesn't want us to be cursed. And then in 3 John 2, Beloved, I wish above all things that you would prosper and be in health even as your soul prospers. He wants our mind, our will, and our emotions to be healthy. He wants us to be physically healthy. He wants us to be financially healthy. And one step, the first step to being prosperous is the tithe, 10% to the local church and for that specific purpose. Now, I know this may be new teaching for some of you, and maybe some of you have heard this teaching before, but you just haven't done it yet. I want to tell you, if you will test God, because that's the only place in Scripture God invites us to test Him. He says, prove me now in, herewith, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing upon you of which you can't contain, that you won't have room for. I want to pray with you right now. Father God, you see the people they want to be blessed. They want to be prosperous. And one of the first steps in that is to tithe. Lord, I thank you for your grace for them to do it. I thank you, Lord, that you also said to test you in this. I thank you, Lord, as they begin tithing to the local church, they're going to see those windows of heaven open over them and they're, you're going to pour out a blessing upon them of which they cannot contain. I thank you, Father God, that you will do that in Jesus' name. God is going to give you the grace to begin tithing today. And I want to hear from you. Reach out to me at karenford.org on my website, or you can reach me on my email, karenb1008 at hotmail.com. God bless you. And I want to see you next week here on Money Matters here on the Glory Network, wherever you're watching, wherever you're viewing, I am praying for you that the God of heaven and earth will bless you financially in Jesus' name. Thank you for joining us today. For more information about Karen or to get a copy of one of her books, make sure to visit her on the web at karenford.org. Join us next week for Money Matters with Karen Ford.